Tried to get by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner. Gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Well, you able to shake away from Solani. It's given away to Solani. Around in front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Three of the fans won one. Score! He's still down there. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're back. We were just saying, it, it feels like uh, it's been eons since we've last done a show. Uh, but it's not, it's not even been a month. It's not even been a month. Two days from now, it would be exactly a month. April 12th was our last show. But so much has happened and not happened, I guess, over the last month. The duck season came to an end. The last, uh, was it seven games? I think uh, we missed. We're played. Ducks, we yeah, went 2-4-1 and one since our last show finished. 31-37-14. Six in the Pacific Division. Tenth worst in the National Hockey League. And we're coming to you live after the draft lottery today where, yeah, they finished tenth. No no movement. The 3, 5, 3 point, whatever, 3.5, 3.7% chance to get Shane Wright didn't happen. And uh, for what is it? Is this the first time in a in a couple of years that the team who had the best odds actually got first overall or am i mm-hmm, i believe so yeah montreal yeah montreal gets um gets shane right so good for them because I... mcdavid edmonton jumped arizona yeah i'm just thinking like the last few like the well the sabers had the worst odds last year did they not and they got power yes yes okay. you're right um, and then before that it was uh they, I know the Sabers. No, do I don't even. Maybe I'm. I'm all. I. I can't remember my draft. I can't remember but if they jumped for down. Same way though. To be fair. Like, yeah. And New. Well, New Jersey there. jumped again, and New Jersey's mm-hmm. jumped every time. Every time I think New Jersey has with the Hisher, with Hughes, and with um this one. Brat. Well, they've mm-hmm. just they've jumped for each of their their picks. So now they get a second. So maybe Cooley. I don't know if they'll take another center. So that we could get it, it early as number two. Um, some some parody because I think Logan Cooley is the I won't say consensus number two but probably the favorite for number two right now. Shane Wright's more than likely going to go number one. But how do you take a center if you're New Jersey? How do you take Cooley to go with Hisher and Hughes? I, I, I don't. We'll have to see. Well, I think I think at this point it feels like the other name that's in that in the running for second overall is a. Uh, What's uh Yurasovsky? You're a lot Yes, Sla- the, Slav- Yurag Slavkovsky. Yeah. 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 That kid, the big kid. Yeah. The big. That would that would uh, that would make sense for them. That that actually would um, complement the rest of the the guys they have. I could see that happening. Or a defenseman yeah. if they want. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Either him or one of the two righties at the top of the draft. I mean, um, you got you Dougie. That... You've got Luke Hughes. Grab mm-hmm. another one. Uh, but the Ducks still get tenth. And there we'll, we'll we'll get into it a little bit too. I mean, actually, we might as well get into it now uh, because we're going to go into a season recap a little bit later. We're going to look at the off season, preview that a bit, and then we have some housekeeping stuff that uh, we got to get caught up on. Sam Carrick's extension, the Ducks naming Rob DeMeo. I think I got that right, DeMeo DeMeo uh, as AGM, uh, and signing Cali Klang to an ELC as well as a couple debuts, Hunter Drew's NHL debut and uh, Olin Zellweger's pro debut for the goals in the playoffs. So that's some of the stuff we're going to get into. But obviously. The freshest news is the draft lottery results tonight. The Ducks stay at 10. As we mentioned, Montreal wins number one. New Jersey jumps three spots to number two. And I think Arizona hangs on to number three. Two years in a row, Seattle gets shafted in the draft and moves down. Right? They, they go from third to fourth. Arizona? Uh, no, Seattle. Seattle got, uh, I think they moved last year too. So Seattle jumped up, didn't they? To mm-hmm. second. No, no. Oh, because they got veneers. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, I, I, I should stop talking about his historic uh, jumping and falling <laughs> in the draft lottery because I'm not getting it right. But uh, the, the Ducks will stay at ten. This, and I'm, I'm probably gonna make a mistake with this one, but for now, fourth straight year with at least a top ten pick, right, for Anaheim, Zegras, Drysdale, McTavish, and now this one. Yeah, because it would go nine, six, three, ten. Yeah. So the third, uh, fourth straight year with uh, at least a top ten pick. Not the, I would say the deepest of drafts. I would say there's anywhere from eight to ten guys, so that that uh, are kind of a tier above um, the guys in the middle of the pack. Here, so the, so the Ducks should get a good player. And as we see every year, there's always one surprise somewhere 
in the top 10 that will push a guy further down. We saw Cole Perfetti fall down to 10 uh, in the Zegers draft. We've seen some other guys fall outside the top 10. Rossi. Yeah, Rossi fell down. Um, you know, every every year there's a few guys that do, and this year there are some guys that could do that. David Yurichek is a, is a guy I know that a lot of fans are are potentially excited about for the Ducks that they could get him at 10 or if the Ducks moved up a few spots to get him. He's been all over the place in rankings because he had the knee injury at the World Juniors that's basically taken him out for the entire year. So you never know how that's going to affect affect a guy's draft stock. You got your your favorite, Brad Lambert, your favorite Finnish Canadian. Not a real person. <laughs> who uh, <clears throat> has all the skill in the world, but people don't know if, if uh, the production is going to come at the NHL level. So he'll be potentially hovering around that spot as well as a, a few smaller forwards in Frank Nazar and Jonathan Lecker and Maki, maybe another defenseman. The Ducks will have some options there at 10. Um, what, what are your thoughts? I, I know you had something you wanted to get into with um, you know, how the Ducks have drafted the last two years, how that could kind of affect what they're going to do going forward. They're, they're going to have options to go either forward or defenseman at 10, um, and you know their best player available might be one of either of them. Yeah, I mean, I think... So what I was kind of mentioning to you before was like, it's really interesting to me to watch the progression of those four lottery picks, right? Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, you have the Zegers draft. They get him at nine. And then even in that draft, Cole Caulfield falls to like 13 or 14, I think, you know, so that's just one of those things where like, you know, just the draft goes kind of funky, but then the next year you have what is considered a forward heavy draft. You've got, you know, that's the one that's got Lucas Raymond. It's got Marco Rossi. It's got Alexander Holtz, Jack Quinn, Anton Lindell, right? You've got all these kind of um, projected top six forwards and Anaheim takes Jamie Driesdale at six. And I, I'm ecstatic about it. I think he's been great. I just think it's an interesting choice, especially when you juxtapose it going forward. Um, but, you know, then then you go, they get third, and they take Mason McTavish in what is supposed to be a defenseman-heavy draft. And, you know, and a bit again, of a reach, the, too, right? I know that yeah. was the COVID season, but I think for where he was drafted, it was felt as a, a bit of a reach. Maybe not so much now, but definitely uh, on draft day, a few people were surprised that he went where he did. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of people had him probably in like the five to ten, five to eight range. And, you know, two spots isn't everything, but it's not insignificant when you're talking um, about drafting in the lottery like that. Um, you know, but that's again, that's got Simon Edvinson, that's got uh, Luke Hughes, that's got um, Brant Clark, I think, is in that draft. Yeah. Um, you know, there, and it's just an, an interesting thing that they take Dreesdale the year before and what's a forward draft. And then the next year they come and they take um, McTavish and, in a defenseman heavy draft. And now they're in a year where, you know, just going off of, I was looking at Cronman's earlier. So that's, you know, that's the one that's kind of fresh in my mind. He doesn't have, he's got Juracek and Nemec going, I think, four or five. Um, and then he doesn't have another defenseman until like 14. And then I don't think there's another one until the late teens, early twenties. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because you can look at, you know, kind of where this season went and what happened. And you, you're looking at like, right. You got James Driesdale, Lindholm's gone. Manson is gone. Fowler's still here. Shattenkirk's still here, but there are these holes, right? Uh, Benoit Mahura looked good at times this year. Um, you know, they each bring different types of things, and, and there's plenty to see there when you're looking at them. We still haven't seen much of Gooley in the last couple of years. Uh, but you add Hellison and, and Bakaninen, and now I think, you know, you're feeling a little bit different about the defensive depth. And so maybe, you know, that frees you up to not feel compelled to take a defenseman this year um, and to go after one of those goal scorers, right? Like, uh, you know, again, like Matthew Savoie, Frank Nazar, like there's your guys whose rankings are all over the place. Like, I don't think Frank Nazar made the top 20 for central scouting yep. for North American his, forwards. His, height, skaters. his height's been a problem. And as yeah. we've seen, you know, like but you like, mentioned with Logan Cole Caulfield. Right? Not, so, he, yeah. But like Logan Cooley is not much taller than him, like an yep. inch, inch and a half. 
And it's funny that like the, the center winger five, dilemma, five, right? Five ten, mm-hmm. five ten and a half feels so much bigger. You know yeah. what I mean? You're just like, ah, oh, he's a little bit closer to six foot. Like I don't know. It's just interesting to me. But so that that was kind of the thing um, that I really I really thought was interesting is just watching the way that the progression has gone. And you know, I know we want to talk about like season stuff. So like I heard, you know, I saw, you know, Jamie Dreesdale put up uh, 28 assists this year, which was fifth amongst all rookies. And you know, second among defensemen behind Moritz Seider. Yep. Um, and that's that's nothing to sneeze at. That's significant, right? Especially for someone who at different times this year looked like he was still finding his footing and, and figuring out the game at the NHL level. And then, you know, you've got all the clips of McTavish where, I mean, that kid just looks like he's going to fill the back of the net. Like, are, you know what I mean? Like, he's just got he's got everything when it comes to goal scoring that you're looking for. He's got a heavy shot. He's got a quick release. He's got a mean one timer. You know what I mean? He can put it in the corner. He can blast it right past you. Like he just looks like he's going to be a very real goal scorer at the NHL level based on, you know, his size now and and the way that um, his skill looks like it should develop and project. But I just think, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to shut up in a second. I'm sorry. But I think just looking at the totality of everything, it, it creates a very interesting context and a very interesting picture of kind of where this team is at. And then, you know, we've kind of all been talking about for, I don't know, four or five months now and all meaning Ducks fans and media and all sorts of people about how big of a summer this is going to be in Anaheim. And I just think the full picture of the context is pretty fascinating as far as what it kind of paints a picture of in Anaheim. Yeah, I, I think the benefit for the Ducks this year, uh, again, is having that second first-round pick. Uh, we've talked about this on, on some past podcasts where, you know, you should, no matter what, and I think the consensus from a lot of people is with whatever your highest pick is, you should take the best player available no matter, you know, what positional need uh, you have. Um, mm-hmm. But having that second first-round pick, I think, allows you to do that and, and comfortably do that, right? So if you're Anaheim and you get to 10 – and you've got to pick between, you know, Brad Lambert, you know, Kevin Krachinski, Pavel uh, Mintuyakov, whoever. If you know you're you're deci- you're not deciding them between a winger, a center, or a defenseman. You're just taking whoever's best on your board, and then you can get to whatever that pick is going to be. With you know, Carolina won tonight, so they're up three two in that series. So you know, if you're cheering for a higher pick, a higher second first round pick. And uh, hope that Carolina wins in Game Six or, or Game Seven and and knocks Boston out because that pick will be, I think, likely around twenty to twenty four. Just kind of depends on who gets eliminated uh, in the first round here. But the higher it is, the better. So you think, okay, you, know, you take Brad Lambert or whoever afford with that pick at at ten. The options for defense around twenty to twenty five. There's a lot more names available, right? There's a lot more guys. It's a little bit defense heavy when you get to the end of the first round, early second, which seems to be the trend for a lot of drafts that are kind of top heavy with forwards. Is the defensemen start kind of peeking in around twenty to thirty to thirty five, which seems to be the case this year. But if you're Anaheim, I think no matter what, attend take whoever's on your list. Like I, I you know, they. It seems that Juracek and Nemec are the top two defensemen in this draft. More than likely, they're going to both go before 10 because there are going to be some teams who want a defenseman and take them. We've talked about New Jersey and a few others that could want a defenseman. You know, Columbus, I think, is another one who could look at uh, either Nemec or Juracek. And we know that uh, Yarmo Kekalainen likes to draft uh, guys out of Europe. So that could uh, that could be where one of those guys go. But if you know, when you look at the other defensemen available, we you know, talked about a few of them already, Denton, Matichek. Uh, Pavel Mintuyakov and uh, Kevin Kuczynski. If you're Anaheim, if those guys are top of your list at 10, take them. Like, if that's who you think is the best player available, take them there and then take the forward at, you know, wherever Boston's pick lands. If you think Brad Lambert or Frank Nazar is the best player available to you at 10, take him and either take the defenseman with that uh, second first or go with your second round pick and take a defenseman. I think you have the, the freedom to kind of mix that up. Uh, with those second, uh, those next two picks that you have, and you know, maybe you move around, maybe you trade up to get a guy that you want. Uh, with that pick not being you know, late, late in the first round, that Boston pick, presumably if they lose in round one, maybe you package that second with the Boston pick and move up in the you know kind of 14, 15, 16 range and take that defenseman, one of those guys who've kind of fallen a little bit before there's a run, and you get you know one of the top 
four or five defensemen in this draft and you get the forward you really want at 10. So they, they do have a ton of options and it will be interesting to see uh, the route that they've gone. But I do feel like in these last three drafts, despite it, you know, some being forward heavy, some being defenseman heavy, I think the Ducks have taken, you know, the top guy on their board, no matter what, you know, Zegras obviously falling to nine. That was a gift for the Ducks and he was the best player available uh, at that point. I think, when you look at some of the comments after the Drysdale draft, it was, you know, the top guys on their board at that pick were Sanderson and Drysdale, and Sanderson went the pick before, and the Ducks took Drysdale because he was the top guy on their list above all the other forwards that were there. And then at three, you know, with McTavish getting taken where he was, you know, we, we don't get to see the list, but you can you can kind of safely assume that he was their top guy there. Like, they wanted him. They reached above probably where they could have gotten him to take him at that third spot. So I'm confident that they'll go into it and, and take the best guy available. And, it, you know, it's it's not number one overall. It's not number two overall. But I, I do think they sit in kind of a nice spot where if anybody does fall, you know, you always expect a few teams, maybe the Red Wings with Eisenman, they reach for somebody. Columbus reaches because, you know, those are two teams that notoriously kind of take whoever they want with that first mm-hmm. round pick. Just, you know, it doesn't matter who, whose rankings you're looking at. They could jump off the board from a guy who's ranked 20th into the top five um, where you get some of these guys like your or others who could fall because of some of the injury issues or play issues that they've had this year. So I think the ducks sit in, in a good spot, you know, the Sabres at nine as well uh, and San Jose at 11, where you can kind of scoop up these guys that have fallen. And you know, like we already mentioned, we saw that with the, with Zegers going to nine a few years ago. So it is, it is a good spot to be in uh, despite not winning the lottery. Yeah. I, you know, <clears throat> I can't believe this, the thing that I'm going to say, but I'm really fascinated by the prospect of of what happens. Let me say it this way. I'm really curious to see what happens with Brad Lambert. Yeah. I think for me, he's going to kind of be the skeleton key um, for this draft because, you know, again, like I said, I was just looking at Fron Instance and he was saying that like he's like an end percentile athlete. Like he's just an incredible athlete. And, you know, we've heard the last year, year and a half about the amount of skill that he has and his ability to impact the games. And it just sounds like he just had focus or motivation or like engagement issues. And, you know, if, if, if it's something like that is the only reason he's falling, um, you know, sorry, let me say it this way. If that is the reason he didn't have a great year this year, right? Cause he had a very poor year this year. A lot of people like, you know, we're looking at it maybe even being like a late teens guy just mm-hmm. because of how poorly he looked at times. Um, but if, if he's a guy that, the only real issue with him is that kind of mental emotional, you know, part of it. Like it's a really fascinating thing to me because that's something you can work with. Right. Like, you know, especially on a young kid, that's something you get him into the room, you get him around your guys, you, you make sure that he's got the kind of influences around him that are going to allow him to kind of develop mentally and mature emotionally and things like that and, and, and stay engaged. But at the same time, like, if those are issues now, there's no, re- there's nothing to say they couldn't continue to be issues forward, right? And then you start to get into that kind of yep. mercurial goal scorer, or you know, I mean, even uh, someone like Patrick Line, who I, I say this with all the respect in the world, is, seems like a really moody player. Um, you know, it, he really didn't like at the end in his time in Winnipeg. He didn't like that he wasn't playing with Shifley, um, and that was a big part of why he kind of wanted out and. You know, it's hard to know what to do with guys like that, especially when the skill level is so high. Because if you think it's something you can wreck, if you, if you think you have the, the institutional support to to address that, then I think it's huge that a guy like Lambert, who, you know, probably has top five, maybe even top three upside mm-hmm. in this draft, if he's available at 10, like, that's huge. Yeah. At, at one point... When you're looking at, you know, two, three years ago when you were projecting this draft and people, look, you know, taking a real long look ahead, it was Bright and Lambert. And Lambert was a guy that people thought could push Shane Wright for the number one spot. And, you know, Wright had his own kind of shortcomings early on in this season and then missing 
the entire uh, season last year because of COVID. Like he had his own reasons where people thought he might not be the number one pick for whatever reason. Uh, and then Lamberts has has had his struggles playing in a significantly harder league. He's playing you know top division in Finland. It's it's significantly harder than the the Ontario Hockey League where Shane Wright plays. But the the production I, it has been the big sticking point for a lot of people. Is you know uh, anything you read on Brad Lambert is he's got you know you don't want to say generational skill and playmaking and, and skating ability, but there are a lot of scouts who say like he is the best skater and puck handler they've seen in the last decade. You know, that's including watching, you know, McDavid and others play at, at that same age. Like he, his playmaking is, you know, his puck handling and, and his skating are at that level. The problem is there's some worry about, like you said, the mental side of the game, whether his hockey sense is up to, up to par with some of these other guys that when he gets to harder leagues, like he's playing in now and gets to the NHL level, you know, that, that skill will only take you so far if you can't adjust it to a higher level of competition. And, and his struggles with two teams in Finland this year, because he ended up switching to a different team, have been concerning for a lot of people, and that's why he's fallen to kind of the 8, 9, 10, 11 range. But that skill level that he brings still puts him in that conversation, right, where if you're a team who's going to take him, you, you've had to have watched him probably more than anybody this year. You know, you've had to have a good eye on him that you know that whatever problems he has that you're confident that you know he can he can get over them when he gets to the NHL level or you can help him kind of work through those issues and I, I still don't know you know if he can be that guy but if I'm Anaheim and he's available at 10 it's very very enticing player to take when you think of a guy at one point who could have fought or people thought could have fought Shane Wright for for number one overall right it's that boomer bust type pick. Uh, but you only take this guy, I think, if you've seen him a lot this year with both teams that he was on at the World Juniors, at every competition he's been at, to know what you're getting. You know, you don't take that shot unless you've, you know, you've been able to watch this guy a lot. Because there are a lot of other guys who are going to be available at 10 who've had really good years, who've risen up the the rankings instead of fallen, who've shown that they're better than people initially thought they were. You look at guys like. Jonathan Lecker and Maki, who was a late first round pick at the beginning of the year, and now, you know, he's jumped up to potentially going into the top ten because he's played well in Sweden. He led the under eighteen World Junior Championships in scoring. He had like fifteen points in six games or something ridiculous like that. He had four points against the US in the gold medal game. So guys like that are rising. Defensemen like Kevin Krachinski has risen up from, you know, basically obscurity into a, a potential top fifteen pick. So you're gonna have those guys who've risen up the rankings, Frank Nazar, who we've already talked about. If you can get over his size, then he's a guy that has risen up the rankings this year as well. And some people have him in their top five. So it, it, it's a tough decision to go into. Like, do you take the guy who was projected to be this great player who's fallen, or do you take the guy who's risen up, right? And, and ultimately it all comes down to you know, your confidence in, in which guy is the best player at that point and how many times you've watched them. And, when we look at who the Ducks have taken, uh, not just with their, their first picks, but even guys like Zellweger and Pastuov and some of the, the gems, if you want to call it that, that they've got. And I, you know, I have the confidence in the scouting staff and Verbeek and everybody there to, to take the best player available and have the confidence uh, that if they take a Lambert, that, that he can become that guy. But it's a real interesting draft to go into. Like when you in the position where you are last year at three and at six, like there's always only like a handful of guys you could really take, right? It's, you know, there, there's a tier of five guys in the top five or, you know, six or seven guys within that range that you can get. Like, when when we went into that draft, we knew Drysdale was potentially one of the guys they were going to get at that spot. And, you know, I know McTavish was a reach, but he was still a guy that we were talking about, you know, one of five guys who they could take here. There's a big list when you get down to ten of, you know, anywhere from eight to ten guys that you could take at that spot. Mm-hmm. If you, you know, whether you take a reach or, or you, you know, a guy falls down or, everything kind of comes together on draft day essentially is you know who's falling who's the number one guy on our list do we want to take a reach for this guy so it's it's a different different spot to be in but not unfamiliar because like we said we were there with the Zegers draft and he ended up falling to us and that was a no-brainer pick so it'll be it'll be a fun one to watch yeah absolutely I mean I'm pretty sure like uh Cam was like 10th or something like that he was in that kind of range um yeah. You know, there, so you said a couple of things that I think are really interesting, and I want to kind of get to. I think 
the first thing worth saying is like uh, when we talk about the kind of engagement part of it, right, or the the stuff with Brad Lambert, right, the kind of nebulous, um, intangible type things as far as what is kind of maybe holding him back. It's, it's really interesting to me because, one, I think this highlights how important um, the pre-draft interview process can be. Yep. I don't want to say is because I am sure there are more – excuse me, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm sure there are more than a few – teams that waste the opportunity by asking stupid ass questions and you know you hear <laughs> yeah there's some there's some the bad ones they ask guys at the nfl at the nfl the draft and the combine and stuff like that so mm -hmm. um you know it, it, but it can provide a very interesting and unique opportunity to talk to these kids about some of what the issues are right like why do you think you struggle what do you think this is what do you want to do you know all that nhl 22 crap um but I also think this is where things like compete, which at times are words people don't like, come into play. And when you look at somebody like Frank Nazar and you contrast Lambert with Frank Nazar, um, Nazar is undersized, but you know he doesn't seem to have a problem competing either on the boards or in the center of the ice and going into the center to you know improve his shooting angle, being around the goalie, things like that. I was watching a little highlight package of him, I think, uh, when the central scouting ones dropped because um, – what's her name? I think it's Lauren uh, – it doesn't matter. I'll tweet it out. But uh, she was just talking about how much she likes Frank Nazar, and she thought it was pretty ridiculous that he wasn't. So I, you know, I looked him up, and you see it, man. He's got that kind of sense and that kind of skill to, to be in the right place, but he also doesn't seem to, to shy away from kind of – the oppor the opportunities that require him to be physical or to take some punishment, right? That take a hit to make a play kind of thing. Um, and, and I just think it's a really interesting way to kind of contrast Lambert and Nazar, right? Where on paper, Lambert is the ace. And maybe on tape, Nazar is the guy who actually stands out because he's just got that high motor. He's got that high level of compete. Uh, you know, and so I just think that's, that's an interesting thing to talk about and, and it, it, it provides a example of why these kinds of concepts um, as, as again, as nebulous as, as they can seem, why they do actually matter. Because at the end of the day, when you draft someone, you're drafting a human being, human beings, emotional, irrational, like all the different things. And so you need to know who you're dealing with and it doesn't matter if, you know, you have all the talent in the world is if, behind the scenes you're not able to kind of put that together and to do what you need to do to be successful especially at the pro level um i'll tell you right now uh, knowing that eakins is going to be around for another year i would not have a problem with brad bringing brad lambert in even if it was just for that rookie camp because as i've said before i think as far as a cultural uh a cultural um tone setter i think eakins is incredible Mm -hmm. um, I really do think he asked these kids to be the best versions of themselves on and off the ice. And I think when you have a guy like Lambert who has all the skill, he can come over and be like, do you want to be as good as you can be? Because clearly you can beat most of these fucking guys. You just have to want to do that. So if you want it, we're here to help you. But if you don't want it, that's on you. Um, you know, so I, I just think that's really, it, it provides a really interesting kind of, turning point i guess for the franchise and you know as much as it was a whole fucking joke this year like i think if brad lambert's there at 10 i unless there is somebody else like you know unless you're a chick or nemec falls that far out of nowhere yeah i don't know that i would be all that enticed to take somebody else because just a pure upside right yeah the upside is there and and at this point right you've got what looks like three of your top six forwards for the next 10 years on the thing already. You've got a guy who looks like he can be a top pairing defenseman. Um, you've got Olin Zellweger, you got Pasty off. Like you've got all these little pieces. You've even got uh was it Sean Chagrill, you know, who, mm -hmm. who kind of shows you that those depths, those depth players, right? Lapina, who just signed uh Calangelo. in the AHL. Colangelo, exactly. So I think you're in a very unique position to take a home run swing at 10 that you know, maybe you wouldn't have thought 
would be the opportunity you had going into the year. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm at the same point. Like unless a guy the the one guy I could see falling that I would say, okay, I'll take him over Brad Lambert is, is Yurichek just because of the knee injury. I, I still think there's a team that's smart enough that they'll take him within the first nine picks especially a team that needs a defenseman like Nemec might go above him because of the injury and might be the first defenseman off the board. But I, I, I just highly doubt eight of the first nine picks are, or eight or nine of the first 10 picks are, there's only one defenseman taken. Um, yeah, I, that would be so funny. It'd be insane. I, I like, I just, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of rattling through my brain of the teams that, that are going to be picking in that spot. And, and, you know, nobody really screams needing a defenseman, but again, it's just the best player on your list. Um, but yeah, he's the one guy I could see falling. I mean, are we sure Philadelphia isn't that in that spot? I mean, I guess they need everything. They need everything, and 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 they could definitely take him. Like I, I think Nem, <clears throat> I do think Nemec ends up being the number one defenseman off the board. I think when all is said and done, I think the best defenseman in this draft is is David Yurichek. But that knee injury is is going to cause some issues, and the fact that he didn't get to play the second half of the season that's gonna that that always presents problems for some teams. Um, so I don't see him being the first defenseman off the board. But there's a chance, like, so because there's a lot of risers among defensemen. Like we talked about Krachinsky, and uh, I I always mess up this Russian name, uh, Mintuyakov. They've had excellent seasons and excellent second halves to their season. So these are guys that like maybe a team reaches and takes one of them instead of Yurchek, and he falls down. So that's why I say like being in this spot at ten, where like if you're Buffalo, you probably take a forward, right? You have power in Dalene. Like maybe you take a forward if Yurchek's there even at nine, and then he falls down. So. You know, long story short, he's he's my guy above some of the other guys that if he does fall, I would take him. But when we're looking at, you know, Lambert versus Nassar, uh, like like your Mackey, Connor Gigi, those types of forwards that would be available at that, that 10 spot, you know, despite the boom or bust kind of tag that Brad Lambert comes with at that point, I, I would still take mm-hmm. him. I would still take him. You, you take that home run swing. He's got the skill to be a top three player in this draft. Just the production hasn't been there and you've had to have watched this guy enough to figure out, you know, whether you can you can get that out of him. You're gonna unlock that at the NHL level. And the one thing I do like about Lambert over, you know, Nazar and a few of the other CHL guys and, and you know, NCAA bound guys, is that you could bring him over next year if you wanted mm-hmm. to. If you felt like that was the next step. This guy's played in Finland in the top league. So the AHL isn't really a major difference to him. It's smaller ice for sure. But in terms of the the level of competition, you know, there's an argument you could say it's either the same, if not worse than the top league in Finland, right? It's, it's at least on par. So it's not like he's facing tougher competition. And this is a guy who's skilled enough that the smaller ice, and he's played in Canada, I think for one season he's, and he's played on smaller ice before, so it's not going to be a surprise like we, we talk about some of some of the other players who come over from Europe to, to adjust to smaller ice, and, and that's going to take a couple seasons. He's at least used to it, and he's been on it before. So I, I like the trajectory there in the sense that, listen, we can bring this guy over next year, and if he adjusts mm-hmm. quicker than we think, he could be a guy who's ready in one or two seasons versus waiting two or three for a guy in the CHL or waiting two or three for a guy to go through his first couple of years in the NCAA, right? Like you've got maybe a bit of a quicker timeline for a guy like this if everything works out. Um, so I, I, I like that a lot about Lambert. So, you know, barring a fall for, for Juracek, uh into 10, if Lambert's there, uh, he's he's the guy taken. I think the Ducks are in uh, in the best spot to you know of, of a lot of the teams that are drafting in that area to take a home run swing. You know, Buffalo needs some some concrete forward prospects, guys who project a little bit safer than a, than Lambert mm-hmm. right now with where they are in the rebuild. We talk about Philadelphia needing something like they they need somebody who is a bit more of a safer prospect, a guy who projects to at least be an impactful player and doesn't have a headlining issue like Lambert does. So you can see maybe Philly reaching for a guy like Nazar, you know, in the top half of the draft, the New Jersey's, the Montreal's, you, know, you kind of know who they're going to take at that point. So I think it really does come down to, you know, Detroit, Columbus, in those, I think the five, six, seven range, those teams and what they do. Uh, mm-hmm. But if he if he makes it past that, and we're talking about, uh, I don't even know who's at eight, but you know whoever's at eight, and then Buffalo at nine, I think there's a good chance he falls down to Anaheim. And eight is Detroit. 
we're, we're potentially looking back at uh, at this draft the same way we looked at the Zeker's draft. And man, how did this guy fall uh, to mm-hmm. us at ten? Right. So I'm I'm hoping for that. I, w- I would have liked to maybe sneak one place up and be in ninth again and and have a little bit of a better chance, but. Uh, we we got to hope to escape the the Yeiser plan again, and and uh, yeah. and hope he falls down to us. The other thing that's really interesting, I think, about this draft, especially considering again, you know, like we've talked about the fact that there isn't, um, th- this doesn't seem to be a draft that everyone is uh, considers an incredibly loaded draft at the top. Usually, what that means is there's more guys who are like going to be pretty darn good, but not necessarily the guys who project with stars, and you know, whatever yeah. they're stars for a reason, they're rare. But the thing about this draft, I think, mixed with that fact of kind of how muddled, like, you know, between 8 and 15 is and then, you know, like 2 or 3 to 6 or 7, right, that yeah. range, Arizona has 7 picks in the top 45. Buffalo has 3 first-round picks. Uh, Arizona has 3 first-round picks. Um, the Ducks have 2, and Columbus has 2. Yep. And I, I tweeted this out when we got the thing. I think of anybody, Columbus came out the best here because the Blackhawks pick stays with them. So yeah. now they've got picks at 6 and 12. If they moved up and one spot, me, they would have had to give that away potentially, right? Because it was top mm-hmm. five protected, I think. So It was lottery protected if it okay. won in the lottery, okay. I think. Um, and, you know, I, I think they're in an interesting position where on six, they can take a pick like we were talking about with Philly, right? Where you take a guy who he has that impact level ceiling, but maybe the floor is a little bit higher. And then if he's there at 12 with your second pick, which is found money, I, I think that's where Brad Lambert makes a ton of sense, right? You know, you bring him into a team that already has Kent Johnson. It's already got um, uh, Wallstrom. And, you know what I mean? They, they, they've got Line A and Frozlovich and all these young players uh, Bjorkstrand, that I, I think could work really well. But, you know, again, Anaheim at 10, like, it, it's such a fascinating spot to be because everybody right around them, right, it goes Ottawa, Detroit, Buffalo, Anaheim, San Jose, Columbus, Islanders. That's a weird run of seven teams. Yep. They're kind of all in different places. They just fired their trots. You know what I mean? So I don't think that Lou is is going to be particularly patient. Um, you know, I wonder if any of the teams like, you know, like Arizona tries to trade up with some of those surplus picks to get back into the top 10 maybe, right? Um, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's just going to be very interesting, and I think there will be a lot of possibilities for teams to kind of wheel and deal in that, 10 to 20 range and, and yep. see if somebody can get kind of creative. Yeah. I, I, I have a, a thought on how the top three is going to go. I think obviously Shane Red's going to go number one. I think New Jersey t- does not take Cooley. I think they go either wing or defense. Maybe, maybe they take damage. Maybe they take gear check. I think that might, that makes the most sense for them or they take Slavkovsky. Like we said, a big winger that does kind of comp is a bit different than what they have in, in some of the smaller, if you want to call it that, guys like Holtz and Hughes and, and Hitcher. So I could see them doing that. I think then Arizona probably takes Cooley at three. They, you know, they get their franchise center, if you want to call it that, until Austin Matthews eventually makes his way to uh, to Arizona. Seattle is the, the wild card again, right, in in the sense that they just they just take whatever is the best player that they think at that spot. They've got Matty Benier, so they got the number one center. But outside of Shane Wright and Cooley, there isn't really a center who jumps off the board. So I think they just take whoever whoever's the best. Maybe they go defenseman. Maybe they take you know Nemec or Yurichek to have that defenseman. So they'll be kind of the first wild card, I would imagine, at this spot. Philly again. Um, I think they 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 could surprise some people, but I I, I don't think they take somebody like Lambert. I think they take somebody with a higher fl- a higher floor so that they get a bit if- of a safer pick. Because I don't think they're He's, they're far away. I, I don't think Philly thinks they're that they need a big rebuild because they've got guys like Hart and York and Frost and and a few others that are there. I think they they take a guy who's a bit of a quicker turnaround than than somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure Philly already came out and said they would be open to moving their pick. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, because again, Sean Couturier is 30. They've got Ryan Ellis is on the other side of 30. Like, uh, they've got Travis Konecki, who I think is already like 25. Like, uh. You know, that that team is in a really weird spot. They just signed Ristolainen to an extension. Like, there, there's all these weird things 
Um, yeah, I didn't even think about that. That's a good, that's a good one. I think if any pick is moved, it's probably that one. If 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 he's there and they don't have a better offer, I have a very hard time thinking Philadelphia doesn't go out and take uh, Slavkowski. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just think he fits what they want there to a T, and the skill um, and the goal scoring ability is enough that I, I think it would be. Um, really promising and they might feel that because he is so so big already that he could come in sooner than later and maybe his his um what do you call it his uh his window to getting to the nhl is a little shorter than some of the other guys yeah yeah i like you that know, one so it's 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 interesting i i think you know i'm sure we're going to try to sit down with a couple of people between now and the draft we've got two months which is insane that there's two months between the lottery in the draft. Yeah. Um, but a lot, we're gonna a lot have of time, time for speculation. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a lot of time to get into trouble, just making shit up about these teams yeah. and these players. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it does get interesting at six and eight. I think that's where, you know, Columbus and Detroit is where, where it gets interesting, where, you know, they could surprise us as they do almost every year. We remember cider and China for, for Columbus. So they always mm-hmm. find a way to, to surprise, but you know Ottawa again. I think they take defensemen if they if they can. Uh, they got a ton of forwards and and then Buffalo. I think they they go the forward route. So that, so it'll be interesting. The Ducks are like we said. We said it multiple times already. They're in an interesting spot where you know depending on what some teams do above them, they could have some interesting players fall to them uh, and and really make a make a pretty big swing at number ten. So they're they're in a good spot. Yeah, I mean they t- they pick 10, 23, 42, and fifty three. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that Boston pick is going to be really interesting as far as, you know, where it falls. Because, I, you know, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Boston goes on a run. I don't think there's any reason to think they couldn't at least make the Eastern Conference Finals. Um, I just, I have a very hard time betting against that team. I just think they're too good. Yeah, um, I don't, I, don't, I can't see run. Carolina losing two in a row. That's the thing. They're up 3-2 in that series. I cannot see them. They're going to lose. You You're think, gonna do it. Yeah, you think so? I have Boston. I picked Boston in that series. I I I, I can't remember. I don't who I picked. trust. I think I don't I trust Boston. their goaltending at all. Carolina, I don't trust Boston's goaltending either. I mean, Freddie hasn't even played for Carolina. It's been anti Ranta. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I don't know how much more I trust uh, Ranta and Anderson than Swayman and Olmark. So <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't know how much I trust either of those, but uh, I can't remember who I picked. I think I ended up picking Carolina, but I think it was in like six or seven. It was close. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it, it's a weird spot. Quick but... question to wrap up the draft stuff. Dave Dave asked a question in the chat. He said, uh, off the wall question because no one is asking these questions. What percentage do you give uh, of the Ducks trading the two number ones to move up the board? And if so, do they move up? to take if they can't get who do they move up to take if they can't get number one so would you see the ducks moving 10 and 23 to move up let's let's say philadelphia at five yeah i i i I think i would say i would almost think it would be more likely that it would be 10 and a player could Um, see that yeah for philly you know what i mean Someone like Henrique, um, if they can fit the cap or something like that, Comtois. Yeah, something, exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, 10 and Comtois for five isn't a bad trade. I, I don't think that's a terrible trade because at five, you're probably going to get somebody um, who's going to hit the league pretty quick. And Comtois still has a lot of value. And, you know, uh, he he's got another year under contract. He's an RFA. He still fits on their timeline, but he's obviously already in the league. So, if they bounce back like they're hoping to, then you know he gives them a great one. Yeah, yeah. So that's the only one I could see um, is is Philly, is Philly trading that pick. I like I don't see Columbus, Ottawa, Detroit, Buffalo, Seattle, Arizona, New Jersey, or obviously Montreal moving any of their picks in the top ten. So I think Philly is going to be the one that a lot of teams are going to be calling on. And the Ducks do have an interesting offer of, of being ten and twenty three if they wanted to move mm-hmm. two picks to move up. To get a guy, if there's a guy they really like, you know, we've mentioned all the names already, uh, so I'll, I'll refrain from doing that again. But if there's a guy available at five, and he doesn't go at number four, you know, you, you get on the phone right there on draft day with Philadelphia and say, hey, listen, like we've got ten, twenty three available. You want to move down, and uh, and and Philly's a team I could see doing it. So um, whether it happens, I don't know. I don't think it's out of the question. And, you know, who did they move up to take at that point? I don't know. Like any, you know, from. From three to seven or three to eight, I think it it's kind of you know muddied water. I think it's it's really who you like the most at that point. If the Ducks believe 
you know, let's throw a name in there. Jiracek is the number two player in this draft, and he's there at five, and they can't believe he's there at five. Yeah. Maybe you make that trade, right? Like, if he's significantly mm-hmm. better than who you have at number, you know, right after him on your board, then move up and take him. Or if, you know, all your other guys in your top four have already been taken except him, and that Philly's willing to do that deal, then move up and get him, right? I, I think they're in a good position to do so. And like you said, you know, whether it's Lindstrom or Comtois or another player or something that you want to, instead of that mm-hmm. other late first to help a team like Philly who still thinks they can win now, um, I think you consider it at least. Uh, it just depends on how much you like that guy who's there at five versus who you could get at 10. And, and is that is that trade worth that difference? And it all mm-hmm. depends. We, we won't know that list until it happens. Yeah, and I think, you know, just as a note, like I think um... – like I said, or like we said, over the next two months, we're, you know, we have plenty of time to kill. So I think uh, once we start to get closer to some of these mock drafts being a little bit more finalized as, uh, you know, prospect or beat writers or a little bit of both or however you want to look at it, start to uh, really uh, kind of identify what the team is that, you know, they cover is looking for and all that kind of stuff, you know, we'll probably go through and do, you know, some kind of just like dumb, crazy ideas thing for the first two rounds or something like that as far as trading up to get somebody trading down to get somebody um you know and and based on some of the 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 mock drafts we'll have a better idea of who may or may not be um in certain areas because like i know the one thing with pronman is he does a mock draft every year that is both he does one mock draft that's his order and he does another one that's based on what he's been hearing yep. about what teams are looking for um, and so I think that's always a really interesting, interesting, uh, two to kind of compare to each other. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I think again, like, I, this is going to sound like I'm being an ass cause it's me, but I'm really not trying to be like, I wonder like, you know, with this summer, the way it is, is Gibby or Fowler, someone who can get them another top 10 pick top 15 pick. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> I don't know. Would the Islanders trade, you know, the 13th pick for Cam Fowler? You know what I mean? I I don't know. You've got Nashville, but they're in a weird spot. Dallas is in a weird spot. Like it's such an odd year, the way everything is, has panned out as far as who is and isn't good this year and how likely they are to be good again next year. Yep. It, um, it's it's going to be a tough one. I think the mo- the most likely one we've talked about a little bit is is John Gibson potentially getting traded. There's, I don't want to say writing on the wall, but with his disappointment, another losing season, the Ducks, you know, trading for a young goaltending prospect, signing that uh, Cali Clank to an entry level contract, Lucas Dostal having a pretty good year again, Anthony Stolar is proving that he can be uh, a very good backup at the NHL level. You you know you you, you get the sense that if it was ever going to happen was ever going to happen that now is the time it probably would happen this off season. Mm-hmm. you know, some rumblings around the trade deadline that his name could be out there. We get that every year. Um, you know, again, you know, beginning of the season, people saying that, uh, you know, Buffalo, I think it was, and a few other teams were, were calling on John mm-hmm. Gibson, but the ducks weren't in a position to trade him. So it does feel like if it's ever going to happen, um, it would be this off season, but yeah, I, you know, that, that's an interesting one. We talked, we talked Toronto kind of jokingly, if they were to crash out of the first round, I know they won game five tonight and they're up 3-2. But the way Jack Campbell's looked in these playoffs, I know it's Tampa Bay, but it hasn't been great. Um, so if they were to crash out of the first round, they would could be a team who would look at John Gibson. Um, you know, There's a lot of other teams that, that could be interested. You know, uh, you know, Dave puts in here New Jersey potentially is a team that could use a, a goaltender uh, if they don't believe Blackwood is the guy to do it or any of the young prospects, Nico Dawes and some of the other guys that they have. So I think there, there, there's some options in the off season. Um, and uh, we, we will get to that. I want to get to that, but we, we got, if we're going to do off season preview, we got to, we got to do a quick off season recap uh, or not off season recap, season recap and look at some of the stuff we missed. Um, we briefly mentioned the way the ducks finished the season six in the Pacific division. Not a great end to the year. Great start to the year. A lot of optimism. The Ducks could potentially squeak in a playoff spot or be better. Ultimately, they finish in a better position than they did the year prior. You know, finishing 10th last instead of, what was it, third last last year. So it is positionally better uh, in a weaker Pacific division. But what are your thoughts? Like, 
all in all, I think there was some some progress made this year. I think you know the players we wanted to see step up and take key roles on this team, specifically Zegris and Terry. Even maybe even took more of a jump than we expected, right? Both getting over sixty points this year. Troy Terry getting very close to forty goals. Not something you would have thought we would have been saying at the end of the year. I, I think you know things went in the right direction, um, and there's a lot of positives to draw back on. But ultimately, it's another season without the playoffs, a bottom ten finish uh, in the league, one of the worst teams in the Pacific Division, barring the expansion team that that came in. To our division so it is um it is tough but i think there are some positives that we can we can kind of draw on yeah <clears throat> yeah i mean i think for me the team finished higher in the standings than i expected to i fully expected this to be a bottom three or four team i didn't think um you know that they were going to get some of the production from some of the players that they didn't and the reason that they did is because they had a, a couple of young players take big steps forward. Um, you know, Troy Terry took a humongous, bed, 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 a humongous, <laughs> humongous, a humongous leap forward. Uh, Zegers showed all of the the skill and creativity and you know energy, right? That you you want to see from a player like that and what you're hoping he can be. You know, and again, Dreesdale had a nice year. He looked yep. good at times. He, you know, he still clearly is learning how to be a undersized defenseman at the NHL, where everybody's bigger and stronger and faster. Um, but again, we saw all the stuff we wanted to see out of him as far as him leveraging his skating to try to mitigate um, any issues that he had based on size disadvantage. And it, you know, he, he did a lot of that. Again, Lundstrom popped for. What was it, 14, 15 goals this year? Um, uh, 16, 16 goals. 16 goals and, and uh, 13 assists, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, but I'm looking at it here. It's 16 goals and eight primary assists. You know, I, I don't know that that's something anybody thought he would be putting up at this point in his career. I feel a lot of us would have expected that to be more of a 25, 25 and team around and is stronger and, you know, maybe he's taking advantages of opportunities a little down the lineup. Um, but, you know, and, and, you know, his shooting percentage was unsustainable. Like, I don't think he's shooting a 20% goal score, but yep. it doesn't matter. He still scored 16 goals, and he showed that the way that he was scoring those goals seemed somewhat sustainable. A lot of it was on the rush. A lot of it was, uh, you know, on the penalty kill, making moves and just trying to get to the front of the net. You know, that's stuff you want to see. I think you can look at Milano as being a huge and pleasant surprise this year. I think you can look at, you know, uh, Sam Steele and Max Comtois and be a little frustrated. I don't, I don't want to say discouraged. I don't think that's necessarily fair to them. Uh, but I, you know, I think there's things there that are still question marks, right? Why did Comtois fall back? Why hasn't Steele looked like he's really improved too much? Um, and you know, they got, they got guys out of there. They brought in good prospects. Like all in all, I, there was a lot about this year to like, and I don't know, I, again, like, I don't know how much of that is just like, I expected them to be absolute dog shit. Yeah. Like I was so prepared for them to be absolute garbage and they weren't, you know what I mean? Like they weren't great. They weren't even really good per se based on, you know, record and finish and point totals and stuff like that. Like, you know, but they're a middle third team at 10. That's not bad. Yeah, it, you it, know, it's I, it, you're all right with that. You, you've made some steps forward, and the negatives are, I think, heavily outweighed by the positives that we saw this year in, in terms of the progression, like we said, of guys like Zegris and Terry and Milano and even Drysdale. Again, I, it, was, it wasn't the best season from him, but 32 points in 81 games as a rookie defenseman isn't bad. Like you said, second in, in assists by rookie defenseman behind only more at Cider, who's up for the the Calder Trophy this year, right? So it who's is going to win the Calder Trophy. Yeah, probably. Yeah, unfortunately, but it um, good season for them. Lindstrom, like you had said, and if the the real negatives, if they're Sam Steele and, and Max Comtois not, you know, Comtois not uh, doing what he did last year, and Sam Steele not taking the same step forward that we saw from some of these other guys then, you know, I, I think we'll take the positives and run with it. The fact, you know, Troy Terry could be a 
uh, perennial 30 goal scorer and Trevor Zegras in his first full rookie season put up 61 points in 75 games if he can continue to improve on that and be a you know a 60 to 70 point guy for the rest of his career that's that's great if he can you know even improve on that and become you know a 70 80 you know close to a point per game player we're talking to upper echelon of, of superstars in this league that are be able, are able to do that on a consistent basis right like to i know the you know league scoring was at a, a an all-time high this year so there's a lot of guys that that had some great years but when we talk about players who can consistently put up 80 points 82 points in, in, in a full 82 game season there's not too many of those guys in this league that can do that right and if zegris can get into that company and he's showing he's on that um that upward trajectory in that path right now that's a huge win for the ducks to get a guy like that at ninth overall and, and the impact that he's had at such a young age and I, I think you know you look back on the season and if if you take into consideration the assumptions we had about how it was going to go at the beginning of the year you have to be happy with how it ended and, and how it finished you know i know they looked great at one point and we we're sitting top of the pacific division with a lot of games played uh, more than than a lot of the other teams but there was some some optimism there that well while things are going a lot faster than we thought we would this this could be a playoff team this year so i know when a lot of people are looking back at how or looking at how this season finished there are there is some disappointment because of how think good things were going for the first half of the season and then it ultimately regressed to what we expected of it and, and it results in a good first half a bad second half and you get where they finish you get you know, a, a you know, middle of the pack team, a, you know, 10th tenth, tenth worst team in the league. So I, I, I do like how it went. I, I do like we saw what we wanted to see progression wise from a lot of these young players. I think the outlook for next season um, is a tough one to project because we saw a lot of guys go out the door this year. A lot of key players mm-hmm. in Lynn Tolman, Raquel Manson and Getzlaff are all going to be gone. They were key contributors for the Ducks this year. Um, and you know, we saw what this team looked like after after a lot of them went out the door. So it's it's going to be tough to replace that next year when, you know, presumably it's Macy McTavish who's going to be the big addition to the forward group. Max Jones is mm-hmm. going to be back. Uh, maybe you pick up a few depth pieces in free agency. Uh, you know, again, you know, maybe you draft a, a Brad Lambert or somebody like that who could potentially step in. You've got Perot and others in the AHL who who could take steps forward. But it's going to be really really tough to have a better season next year than you did this year. But it, it, it's going to be a fun one, just, again, to to have those expectations, to see if Terry and Zegers can continue to improve on what they did, to see what Mason McTavish can, can do in his rookie season, to see how Perot and Tracy, maybe Zellweger and others get on and you know their pro, you know for some of them their first pro season for pro and Tracy their their second and third kind of full pro seasons and and getting a few more games with the Ducks. So there's a you know there's a, a real transition point I think that you can note from this season to next when we see a lot of these older pieces of the core now gone. You know four real headlining names of the last decade for the Ducks and Getzlaff, Raquel, uh, Manson, and Lindholm. Right, you know those are for the marquee names of this team over the last five to six seasons that aren't going to be there next year. So there's a lot of room for guys to step up, which is something we haven't seen. We've, we've talked about the log jam at certain positions where guys just can't get in. Well, that that's not really the case anymore. And, <laughs> and whether, you know, whether some more of them go out the door at, at the draft and in, in, in the off season that, uh, that only opens up the door for a lot more guys. So it, it might be a tough season next year in, in terms of results, but I think we're going to see, a lot of change, a lot of young guys step up, and, and some more guys take some steps forward. So that's always exciting to be able to look forward to that. Yeah, I think something you said that I thought was interesting was you were talking about how we are seeing scoring go up uh, as far as the the high-end uh, player point totals, right? The offense, the elite offensive players, the production is scoring up, right? We saw Roman Yossi score 100 points. Uh, we saw Kale McCarr score like 20 something goals, I think, right? You've got Dry Seidel, McDavid. Um, I think Matt, no, I don't think Matthews, but like, uh, I can't think off the top of my head, but like, there's more than a few players that hit 100 points. Like, mm-hmm. the, the, uh, Huberto hit 100 points. Like, there's, there's a lot there. And, and I think because, because you can see the, uh, the, 
the high-end offensive players are able to put up larger numbers, I think that's actually encouraging for a player like Terry, right? Where the big question, right, heading into next year is going to be, okay, how much of that was real? And how much of it was, you know, the fact that you did shoot 20%. Now, I think there are a lot of reasons to think it's sustainable. I think the way that he did it, I think we watched him struggle at different times as far as the production not being there. Even if the play was there, we saw the production wane, which is always a big uh, hurdle for young offensive players. Um, you know, but I, I, I think the idea that, yeah, maybe he can be a 30 goal scorer and, you know, close to 70 points or 80 points, uh, you know, maybe he does get to 40, uh, you know, but even if he's only 30, 35 goals and, you know, 40, 45 assists, like that's still huge. That's not nothing at all. Yeah. And then you look at some of the players coming in, you look at Zellwecker, who looks like an incredible and, and, and dynamic offensive uh, talent. And you look at McTavish and the goal scoring ability, and then you've got Perot, you've got Pastiov, um, you know, you've got whoever the hell they get this year. Like, there are a lot of reasons to think that the top of this lineup is going to be very strong um, uh, going forward. And next year will be about how much of that is real. Um, you know, what happens with Zegris? Right? How does he react to now? Everybody knows he's coming. Yep. You know, there's not the first 35, 40 games or, you know, 30, 35 games where you're catching guys off guard just based on the fact that you haven't done anything yet, right? Even though he was making good plays, he was putting up points, it's still this could fall off at any time. He's a rookie. And I, I don't think that's unfair. Now it looks like it's real. Troy Terry, same thing. I don't, you know, I don't know how Troy Terry gets to 37 goals again next year, especially uh, when the player he had so much success with is, is retired. Then you're going to have Perot, right? Is probably going to at least get 15, 20 games next year. I have to imagine like yeah. they're going to put him into the lineup, even if he doesn't stick, even if he doesn't seem quite ready, he's going to get shots to, to, you know, come up, especially if players get traded or injuries happen. Uh, same thing with Tracy and Mahur and Benoit. Like, what are they going to want to be? Like, can they be good bottom pair defenders? Because that's all you need them to be at this point. You need them to be good, capable bottom pair defenders. They don't need to be more than that. Anything above that is huge, and, and you take it every day. But I don't think the expectations for them now especially are, are going to be that high. Um you know, I mean, there's like players that we haven't even talked about. Like, um, Dave just meant Limoges, and you've got, uh, I want to say Elvish, but what's the kid's name? Elvin, the kid that they picked up from Vegas? Uh, Elvinus, I think. Elvinus, yeah. Um, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be more than a few guys that are going to have an opportunity to make something kind of stick around next year. And I imagine there's going to be one or two guys that come out of nowhere. You know, plus, like you said, there is guys you can add in free agency. We know uh, Verbeek has talked about wanting to use some of his uh, draft capital to move around, right? Whether that's move up in the draft, whether that's go out and get uh, a player, something like that. Um, next year, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it's going to be similar to what I kind of felt the expectations should have been for this year. Yeah. Calder Trophy, Calder Cup, lottery win. That, that's the three that I, you know, it looks like we're going to go over for this year, but that's fine because all the reasons you're going over are good, right? If yeah. Zegris and Dreesdale are still down there, we win the call. Or, well, let me say this. I don't think we're out in the first round if Zegris and Dreesdale are still in... In San Diego, yeah. Um, in San Diego, thank you. Uh, you know, so I just think there's a lot to be excited about. There's... A lot of questions. Uh, you know, I know this kind of started out as like, how far away do we think they are, or, or um, things like that. But you know, I think we should be prepared for at least another two years of bottom ten finishes, and after that, I think it'll start to get very real. And I think that we'll start to see this team take big steps forward. Um, you know, and if not, then we're going to have a lot of answers about some of these young guys over the next two years if they're not there yet. Um, yeah, we, we say this every year um, in terms of, you know, the Ducks' success hinges on a lot of ifs, ands, and buts with, with a lot of players and whether 
whether this guy can take a step forward, or how's this guy's first NHL season going to go. And, of course, we go into next year's, you know, their their success depends on can Terry and Seegers repeat or do better. Can McTavish come in and have an immediate impact and challenge for the Calder Trophy? Uh, mm-hmm. Can, you know, Max Jones return to the lineup uh, and, and be an impactful player, uh, you know, if he gets – gets an opportunity to come back can Maxine come to our return to the, the form from two seasons ago right is you know who's going to be in net if it's John Gibson can he get back to you know the the prime years from a couple years ago if it's not him can Lucas Dostal you know be a starting net minder at, at at the you know young age and and prove that he can be that can he form a tandem with Anthony Stolarz and the list goes on right if is Jamie mm-hmm. Drysdale going to take a step forward offensively and defensively so there's a lot of ifs for the Ducks next year and and their success hinges on that uh, but you know, I know, I know for me, like I am really excited to see Mason McTavish. Uh, we know he's going to get you know, the the reins to go out there and, and be successful. He's going to be put in p- a position to succeed. He's going to play in this in the middle of the ice, and presumably we could see a one two d- down the middle of Zegers and McTavish, which is great. It's exciting to be able to, to to think that we could see that as as much as it sucks that there's no Getzlaff to to transition from Ryan Getzlaff to then. You've got your top two young forwards as your number one and two center the year after that. That that's exciting. That's that's fun to see and 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 I'm, I am very excited to see Max Jones back. You know for yeah, absolutely for him to jump into the lineup and what he could. They're bring. gonna they exactly right. I I think they're gonna need him yeah. to to really kind of come back all all cylinders going. Uh, but it's it, it made me think when you were talking about, you know, we talk about this every year about all the ifs, ands, buts and how much of it just kind of just hinges on young guys. And that's just a, a waiting game slash a guessing game. Um, I think the thing that's maybe not different the last couple of years, but certainly uh, the the handful of years before that is there's no stakes. You know what I mean? Like I, I you're not bringing these kids into a situation where you need them to contribute right away, right? It's yeah. not like Toronto where Nick Robertson, you're either a full-time player or you're not. Yeah. There's no in between. We don't have time to wait for you. So you either step into the lineup and you're ready to go or you're not. And we're going to keep you down and let you to continue to develop, but we can't slowly bring you along at the NHL level in a way that maybe we would like to, because We've got these guys right now, and they're good. And, you know, for Anaheim, there's none of that pressure. You know, everything they fought, they, you know, the wins or the moral victories or, or whatever it is, I think a lot of it is is all found money. Um, you know, it's really just about seeing what's real, seeing which of these guys can make a difference moving forward and which ones can't. And that's going to be the other part of this is there are going to be guys who come up short. Yeah. That's just the way it goes. We're well, already it's seeing not, that, right, with, with yeah. guys like Sam Steele. So. You know, and it's it's not an, an indictment of them as players or as people. It's just the reality. Not everybody's an NHL player. If there were, they wouldn't make so much money. Um, you know, so it's it's going to be interesting to see. And I'm very excited, you know, even with, like, Hellison, you know. Yeah. Are we going to get a Hellison-Zellweger pairing next year? That would be very cool. I would love that. Even if it's in San Diego. Now, I don't think Zellweger's old enough to play for San Diego yet. I think he'll only be like 19 next year. Yeah, I think so he's he got one more be, year of junior left. He might be back in juniors. Um, you know, but but it's nice to know that that pressure isn't necessarily there as far as these guys are going to have to jump in to the deep end right away. They don't have to do that. And I think that's going to provide a very um, – gr- a very unique and a very beneficial opportunity for this team to take its time for, to give Pat Verbeek a full year to really see what he has. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what he does this summer, obviously it's going to tell us a lot about what he's looking at as far as strengths, weaknesses, uh, distance from competing, um, things like that. But he is going to be able to take next year and take a very long, hard look at who's on this team in the future and who's not. Yep, I, I think I think uh, Zellweger gets the nine game run uh, at the start of the season, depending on how training camp goes. Uh, but I would imagine he, he gets a test to see how he does, and then they'll decide f- from there to send him back to junior. He's really the only guy right now who's kind of in that position. I don't think Pastuov is ready. I think he'll probably go back to junior for another year because uh, they really want them to, you know, 
the, the mantra seems to be we want them to dominate in that league before we kind of make that decision. You know, Mason McTavish definitely has done that, was doing that before, mm-hmm. and has gone back and done that. Olin Selweger has done that. So McTavish will be with the team this year, had his nine-game stint and, and looked impressive uh, at the beginning of this year. So that's that's what I wanted to ask you. I would say, do you think it's more likely than not that McTavish plays 75 games next year in Anaheim? Yeah. I, I just I, I don't see the benefit from sending him back down to junior. Like we, We've seen it this year, what, yeah. he, what he's doing, almost two points per game, almost a goal per game. He's in the playoffs with over a goal per game right now. Um, it, it, you know, he's a man amongst boys down there. It's, 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 a, it's a joke for him to have to be playing down there. It's great that he's dominating. It, you know, he's doing everything you need. We saw it with Comtois when they sent him back down is, you know, we thought he was ready when, when he was originally up and they're like, no, we're going to send you back down. You're going to dominate. He go, he went down there and did that. And since then he's been with the ducks, right? Uh, I can't imagine McTavish, no matter how, you know, the first nine games go or whatever, or, you know, maybe, you know, I, I just don't see them sending him down at any point. Now, if he plays 20, 25 games and it doesn't look great, you can send him back down at that point. You know, it's mm-hmm. a one-way trip. You can't bring him back up, but you can send him down to junior 20, 25 games in and say, listen, it's not working out. We're going to send you back down mm-hmm. uh, and we're going to put somebody else in here. So that's the only way I could see him not playing a lot of games. Uh, with the Ducks next year, you know, 60, 70 games, is if that's the case where he comes into the Ducks lineup, does not look good for a long period of time, uh, is a healthy scratch for a few games or whatever, and uh, and then gets sent back to junior that way. I mean, I, that's the worst-case scenario. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, but barring that, I, I see him playing a, a bunch of games for the Ducks next year. And I think Olin Zellweger, like I said, becomes that, uh, that nine-game stint guy where they test him out for a bit. Uh, you know, see how he does in training camp, see how he does in rookie camp, give him a, a few games at the NHL level, see how he does, see how he's adjusting, and then at that point make the decision of whether you're going to keep him up or send him back because he's going to have a chance, right? Like no Lindholm. Uh, it's really only Fowler on that left side who is, is blocking any anybody's spot from getting in. So he's got two positions to kind of jump into there. And on the right, it's just Shattenkirk and Drysdale, right, of, of kind of the top guys that are, are guaranteed a spot. Uh, on this roster, so Zellweger, you know, his his opposition is Mahura, is Gouli, is Larson, is Benoit. If he can prove he's physically ready Vakanainen. for the NHL level, yeah, Vakanainen, you know, that's those are guys he could beat a spot, right? He could beat out oh, absolutely for just just the way he plays, like dyna- you know, his dynamic offensive ability. He's better than those guys, and as mm-hmm. long as he can physically show that he can compete at the NHL level, he's he's a guy I think that could sneak onto the. Uh, onto the Ducks roster next year. But, yeah, I, I think Pastrov is probably a guy who goes back to junior next year and they want to see, you know, a over-point-per-game player and, and, and progression off his first year. He had a great first year this year, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I think he's a guy they're going to set back and, and look for a little bit more from. But let's get into our, our off-season preview because we're talking about it right now. We talked a little bit about what we think Verbeek will do uh, in the off-season. You know, potential trades. John Gibson is just one that's come up a few times. And then looking a little bit ahead to, to free agency and offer sheets. First chance for for, for be really to, to continue to make his mark is, is heading into the draft. What do you, what do you think he does? You know, we've talked about moving moving picks and moving up. Um, we've talked about you know guys, other guys getting potentially traded at the draft. How how busy do you think Verbeek will be come draft day and, and on the days leading up to the draft? I will say I expect to hear one of those classic they're in on everyone things uh, about the week before heading into the draft. I I think, you know, that's when it kind of gets real for the GMs. You start to see some of that stuff pick up as far as, um, oh, my God, my brain just completely turned off. Uh, as far as GM's kind of starting to realize where they're at and what's coming up and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I expect that, that week going in, I expect to hear his name quite a lot. I hear, I expect us to hear, I mean, I mean the, I, you know, like it's almost going to be like a United transfer window. We're going to hear everybody's name. Whether yeah. or not any of it comes true is a different conversation, but I do fully expect to hear Verbeek in on anybody. You know, if Konechny is available, I don't see how we're not in on Konechny. You know what I mean? Like, there's going to be players who are available that they're not, you're not thinking about now, 
And it's going to be interesting to see which direction he goes, right? Because on one hand, he could look to move out some of the older players, try to move a Silverberg with retained salary, try to move a Henrik with retained salary. You've got Gibson, you've got Fowler, you've got Shattenkirk, 3.9, only one year left on that deal, right? There are guys that can be kind of shuffled around a little bit. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we also don't see him maybe move out some of the less exciting prospects. You know, I, I'm not 100% sure Sam Steele's on this team next year. It wouldn't surprise me if he got moved for a third-round pick, you know, or a late second or something like that, uh, or he got thrown in with a pick to move up in the draft or something like that. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I'm very, very curious about the Lundestrom situation because he's an RFA, and let me see. Is he – yeah, he's uh, arbitration eligible, and he had a good year statistically. Yeah. You know, uh, I know some of the underlying numbers are, are a little concerning as far as the impact he was able to have. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I wondered is so back to Lundstrom real quick. Sorry, my brain is scrambled. I apologize to everybody. I'm a little more scattered brain than normal right now. Um, you know, if Lundstrom's ask is too high, we uh, Verbeek's going to move his ass. He doesn't have any loyalty to him, any 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 ties to him. He is trying to do the best that he can for the thing. He kicked David Nonis' ass out of the building. He kicked Tom Marchand out of the building. Like, he clearly does not have a problem making decisions that he thinks make the team and the organization better. Yep. So if Lundestrom asks for something that he considers to be a little ridiculous, yeah, dude, I could 100% see him not being on the team next year. Um, Gibby is the one that I, I expect, you know, we, we talked about this, I think with Brad Lambert in the draft being the bellwether. Uh, I expect Gibby to be the bellwether. If Gibby's on this team next year, I, if Gibby's on, I think Gibby is the biggest move that they can reasonably make. Yep. And I think um, it's the most likely one that, that yes. gets done too of the big moves. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you there. I think it's the most likely. And I think it's, um, it's the biggest move they can make, right? Because you can get a team who, you know, needs that mid prime goalie, or late prime goalie or whatever. who can, you know, hash out the fucking what Gibby is later, mm -hmm. but he's the kind of guy that, you know, could be interesting to a lot of teams. Yeah. Um, a lot of teams you crash out of the playoffs for whatever reason and not happy with their goaltending. Again, we're looking at, we just talked about Boston. We talked about Toronto, uh, you know, Dallas potentially. I know they really like Jake Ottinger, so that's likely not going to happen. But there are going to be teams that crash out. Minnesota, and, yeah, Minnesota. Um, you, you know, and and upstart teams that are looking to moldy. to do better, right? Moldy. Talking about uh, New Jersey, I think Dave brought up New Jersey as, as a potential mm -hmm. team as well. So there's going to be a lot, and and you know, we, we got to address something that Brett mentioned. He said, "You understand, we need to add cap, not lose it." I, I think with any of these trades, you know, if John Gibson is dealt, um, you know, if if whoever, if Henrik or Silverberg are dealt. One, the way you keep some of the cap is like you'd said, you retain the salary, make it a bit more intriguing to a team uh, that, that is kind of tight against the cap to bring in a guy like that. And two, you're, you're using your cap space to bring in some bad contracts as well. We saw that almost happen with the Dadanoff trade. I think, so that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I'm very curious to see if the Dadanoff trade is revisited. Or just uh, trades like it. Like I, I, I could see the Ducks well, yeah, looking to that, help out some absolutely. teams. Yeah. Yeah, I think that absolutely highlights that Pat Verbeek is willing to make those moves. Yep. But I think Dadnov is a very interesting and unique one because Dadnov, after that whole debacle, he came out hot. He showed that he can still be a productive player in a top six role. If you're going to eat a huge salary, why not eat it on a guy that you can at least get 20 goals and 40 points out of? Yeah. You know, and add a little bit of veteran goal scoring to the top of your roster. That's huge. You know, if you can move on from a Henry, even if you can't move on from a Henry, you know what I mean? Like if you can do, you know, Henry, Dad, Nov, and Terry or something, you know, next year as a, a second line or something like that, I, I think you have to be very open to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I get the, they have to add money. They only have $40 million in cap. And if you move out a six and a half or a five and an eight and kind of stuff, but like, again, like you said, you're going to have to bring money back. It's a hard cap. This is, there aren't teams that are going to be able to go into a, a luxury tax or anything like that. Um, you know, there's going to be hard. I, you know, do they take on a Kessler contract type of thing, right? Do they take on a Michael Furland 
uh, up in Vancouver, who I think's got like two years left, making yeah. three and a half million. That's not a ton of money, but that's enough that it matters, especially for Vancouver, who's got a bunch of players they're trying to keep. You know, um, it'll be interesting. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I kind of expect it to be a mix of both. I imagine that, uh, I think it was Tara Vinan was who um, Carolina got for taking on a bad contract from Chicago after one of their cup wins. Yep. Um, my name is Dave Boland. Well, like, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, going back to the Gibson thing is, as Kevin Fiala, a, a guy who potentially could, you know, he's a pending RFA, part of a potential John Gibson deal, right? It's Kevin Fiala is the type of player the Ducks would need, a goal-scoring winger, young enough that he kind of fits into the plan right now. I think he's 24, 25 years old. Maybe that's a piece, you know. He's going to be 26 next year. Yeah, he's close enough. <laughs> no, 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 I... But yeah, like I, I think I think yeah. those are things you can explore. Where yeah, you know, yes, you're moving out six and a half uh, or six point four John Gibson. Um, you're likely going to sign Fiala for around that. Maybe you take on another another contract from Minnesota to to offset some of their cost um, in in a, in them getting John Gibson right. So I, I I think the Ducks are in in potentially one of the better spots of any of the teams right now in, in terms of the flexibility of what they can do this off season. Whether it is going out and making a big trade and acquiring somebody like connect or something like that or you know we've we joked kind of in, internally about matthew kachuk as a as an offer sheet or, or you know a trade for his rights if calgary can't get him and Gaudreau signed uh you know we talked about line a and a few other guys they're they're in they have the possibility to go out and do something like that whether it's an offer sheet or a big move to bring in a guy like that they also could move guys out and, and make a big trade of their own they could move up in the draft they could go into free agency and make a splash if they really wanted to they can bring in salary they can move out salary like they they really have no limitations of what they could do and they've got a gm who really wants to make his stamp on this organization uh, and is willing to do anything uh, as we've seen at the deadline and and the interviews that that uh, that we've seen from from Pat Verbeek, they you know he's really open to doing anything to help this team. So it's uh, it's a fun spot to go into in the off season to know like there's a lot of different cards on the table of what they could do. And you know we we might as well talk about it a bit because we talked about the trades. But like looking at free agency and and some guys who could be available or looking at uh, I know they don't happen really ever unless you're Montreal and Carolina and you hate each other, but offer sheets potentially. Of, of some teams that are up against it. You talked about Vancouver, and guys like Brock Besser and, and, and others who need to get signed. Uh, Patrick Laine and Columbus, whether he's happy there or not, they don't really have any cap issues. But then the big one, again, uh, is Calgary. You know, Likely it's Johnny Goodrow who makes way because yeah. if they can't afford to get both, but maybe they get into a situation where they sign Johnny Goodrow to you know a, a $9.5, $10 million deal and they're trying to make room for Matthew Kachuk and they can't make it work and you hit them with an offer sheet, right? daydreaming a little bit here but the the ducks definitely do have the option to do a lot of different interesting things this offseason and those included all right here it is cam talbot matt dumba carson lambos uh for john gibson and x player like i don't know sorry it's Lam- lambos dumba and who lambos dumba and talbot mm. Who makes three point six 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 seven million dollars? Because they do not have a ton of cap space. So if they're going to bring in somebody, they got to move a couple of guys out. Talbot and Dumba are guys that are going to be UFA uh, next summer anyway. So it makes sense for them to move them out. That gets them about ten million dollars in cap space. Um, you know, which gives them about seven million roughly. Maybe they make another move or two. Um, but you know, you end up with a, a little bit of extra money there to try to keep Fiala. Um, you know, and now you're looking at taking Gibby as your goalie and you're taking Fiala and Boldy and hopefully Rossi, uh, you know, and that, that's who you're, you're running through next year with behind that, uh, uh, Erickson, not only Joel Erickson act line behind mm-hmm. the Capra's off line. Uh, maybe Ryan Hartman is able to move back to the wing instead of playing at center. I, I I think if anything, if 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 you're making a deal with Arizona if, or not Arizona, Minnesota, if, I, if I'm the Ducks, I think Kevin Fiala has to be the piece you're getting back, because um, I don't you know the the situation Minnesota's in. I don't think Boldy and Rossi are going anywhere, um, and I like Carson Lambos. Have Lambeau's. to get Fiala back. 
why wouldn't you rather let them keep Fiala and use that as the leverage to gouge him? Yeah, because potentially. Here's the thing. If you take Dumba, you're getting a first for Dumba at the deadline. Right-handed shot, he's physical, he puts up goals, he can be on a power play, he can play 5 on 5 he can play on a penalty kill. You're going to get a pick for him. He's going to be, you know, 28 at the deadline next year. Like, I just, yeah, I, I think, I, I get what you're saying, but Kevin Fiala is 25 right now, and he turns 26 in July. So he will be 26 going into next year. That's not... That is not so old that he's not useful, but that basically means you have to compete within the next one to two years because you're still going to want that two to three year window between 27, 28 and 30, 31. And if that's the case, you're putting the, that starts to put pressure on some of your young guys and that maybe speeds up the timeline a little, you know. I, yeah, I, I like I, I feel the same way about Forsberg. Like I would love to add those guys. They're dynamic. They're you know incredible goal scorers. They're wonderful skaters. They're creative. We've seen it in the playoffs. You know even when they're getting their teeth kicked in, they're still guys who can make things happen. But I don't know that you want to give them the money that they deserve to not be part of your window. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it is tough, and and I, I do think Fiala is kind of right on the the cusp of of being a part young enough to be a part of this window right like he he is 25 he's going to be 26 this summer in july uh forsberg i think is a bit different because he's i think 28 turning 29 or 27 mm-hmm. turning 28 by by the start of next season so again those those two years i think do make a difference um i think when you're looking at those two trades you know i, I like always bringing in a, a young player like carson lambos but I, I think if i had to pick between you know, Lambos and what is potentially a late first round pick that you're getting for Dumba, maybe another B level prospect or Kevin Fiala. I, th- I think I take I think I take a guy like Kevin Fiala every time, right? A, a guy who's improved mm. season on season, proved this year, and again, you know, you know the, this season you take kind of the numbers with a grain of salt because you don't know if it's ever going to be like that again. Maybe this season was a one-off. Who knows? Um, probably not the way the league is trending with, with more goal scoring. But you know, this, this is a guy I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear. 33 goals, 85 points this year in 82 games Kevin Fial had. The season before that, 20 and 20, 40 points in 50 games. The season before that, 23 goals, 54 points in 64 games. So he's had three really good seasons. Um, and then obviously this year was crazy. And, and the big thing for me is – the 85 points came not playing with Kirill Kaprizov, so you can't say it, his production there is because Kirill oh, Kaprizov, no. right? So it it is for me. I think he's right on the uh, on the cusp of being a little bit too old for what we're looking for here. So I I, I think if you were going to make that trade, I, I think those are the types of guys you're looking to get in the 23, 24, 25 year old guys who are impactful players are ready. If you're moving out a guy like John Gibson, I, th- I think that's what I'd be looking to bring in or, you know, the, the bona fide top prospects from, from certain teams. You know, if you could get a boldy, obviously that would be the guy you'd be looking at, but I, I, I highly doubt uh, he's moved for anything. Here's the thing that I think we need, Eddie, because I think this gives me and you exactly what we want and also sets us up to do what we need to do this summer. Minnesota needs to win the fucking cup because if Minnesota wins the cup, then they can trade Marcus Felina. If they trade him before they win the cup, that sucks. But if they win the cup this year, then say, thank you very much. You and your $3 million contract are going to go to Southern California. That's aces. Mm-hmm. You get Talbot, Felino, maybe their 28 pick at the draft, Lambos, uh, you know, for Gibby, like that's not a bad deal at all. No. Like I, you know what I mean? I, so I don't know. I just, uh, I want Minnesota to win the whole damn thing anyways. <laughs> and now I'm talking myself into it even more just because uh, we can maybe send Gibby up there. As uh, Dave likes to point out, we are verging, getting close to two hours, an hour and 35 minutes. Um, we have yeah, also not, podcasted for a month so we do have a lot to to get caught up on usually this would probably be about two episodes at the very least <laughs> that we would get into um but I, let, let's wrap up with the off-season kind of preview we'll we'll go into a more of an, an off-season preview on, on an upcoming podcast where we can really break it down by free agency in the draft and 
and do things that way. I think we'll we'll have kind of separate shows where we do a draft preview and we have a guy, you know, somebody on to, that knows a little bit more than us to, to talk about some of the guys available and we'll do a free agency preview and we'll kind of separate those. But the, the last thing I kind of want to chat about, we mentioned it briefly, with the potential for some offer sheets this year, and I know we've we've had some offline discussions about that uh, pretty heavily because we we have nothing better to do. But uh, when you when you look at some of the guys available, we you know Fiala, Line A, um, Besser, Kachuk, you know, for you, who's worth an offer sheet? And Kachuk, yeah, yeah, that that's the guy for me. I think he's the only guy worth the offer sheet. I agree. Um, uh, what what what? How far are you willing to go? We we had this conversation in a chat a couple of days ago. But how how high are you willing to go, and how much are you willing to give up to get him if you had to offer sheet him and looking at the compensation? So, the first thing for me that would matter the most in my willingness to offer sheet him is term, because there are there has been talk I think over the last year and a half, maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, especially with Kachuk's RFA status coming up, that you know some people think they're going like he and then even Brady maybe down the line are going to try to get to UFA so they can just walk to St. Louis where they grew up. Um, and if that's a thing, then I, you know you can't give up multiple first round picks for a guy who's going to leave in two three years. Yeah. Uh, but if you can commit, get him to commit to eight uh, eight years, I, I have. I would give him eight by nine right now, eight by 10 even. I mean, he, he's a selkie, win- uh, he, sorry, he's not a selkie winner, but he is a selkie quality player at both ends. He provides an edge and a, a, a physicality that I think this team very much needs. Um, and, and again, like he's just a really good fucking player and he's young. And, you know, if you told me that the top line was, uh, Kachuk Zegras Terry, yeah, man, let's go. I don't give a shit. That's the best thing in the world. What are you talking about? I, you know, I'll give you, you know, three, three firsts and three seconds for that. I, I absolutely will. Um, one of the eight guys to get over a hundred points this year. Hundred. Yeah, he's just he's 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 fucking incredible, man. And you know, I I just think there are so many things about him as a player that I love that it would be very nice to, to – I would be very willing to maybe be a little dramatic in my pursuit of him because the truth of the matter is is he would be the guy who would take up the mantle for Perry as far as you know yeah. the guy who's going to develop vertigo when the paint is blue and, and drive the other team crazy and get them to take penalties and stuff like that. And, you know, again, you're insulating and adding support to a team that's already got McTavish who's about to come up, you know. Um, I, I think the offer sheet thing is something I would be very willing to explore. I'll be very curious to see if Pat Verbeek does it. But the other thing about it is, is I wonder if the risk of an offer sheet is worth calling Calgary. Yeah. Right? You know, like, look, we can do this, and then you can have to choose. And maybe you'll get a few picks, but you guys are clearly good now. Whereas right now I'll give you, you know, I'll give you what you figure Zellweger, Comtois, a first, probably Perot. Like, you know what I mean? Like just fill the bucket and just be like, let's give you pieces that you can at least get into the lineup sooner than later because you need them. Yeah. Than you know a twenty twenty five first round pick that doesn't do you any good on a team that's currently in their window. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting one, and it's I mean it's it's a way out there theory. Offer sheets rarely happen, uh, if at all. Uh, but yeah, if there was a guy right um, that that you could offer sheet at this point, like he's he's the guy. Like he is is a no brainer in terms of going out and trying to make that happen or trying to make a deal to get him if you feel like they're going to be in a tough situation. Realistically, they let Goodrow walk if they feel like they're they're going to be backed into a corner and have to choose because I don't see how you choose Johnny Goodrow over Matthew Kuchuk, um, you know, with their ages and their impact on the lineup and on more areas and just putting up points. So I I think it's it's a pipe dream for sure, but it is one uh, if you have the opportunity to put them in a tough situation and try and get them, you got to do it. You, you just have to. You have to go out and try and get them. So, uh, I'll, I'll Real quick, uh, what, what looking at cap friendly mm-hmm. 
if they did seven years by ten million, that would be two firsts, a second, and a third. Yep. I, that I that, would do that, that puts. I yeah yeah I would one hundred percent do because that because to me they are not a bottom uh, a lottery team or a bottom five team with Matthew Kachuk in this lineup next year. They're not, right. and that's the thing. Matthew Kachuk is the quote unquote bird in the hand, two in the bush to Connor Bedard. Yeah. Um. So uh, you know, wow, that's a very intriguing choice, especially if again, like I said, you can get him to sign. And in, in, with serious term, six, seven years. Yeah. Um, and know that you got him for that prime. And now, you know, I mean, look, you've already at that point got three wonderful American boys who can yeah. be beautiful On together. one line together. Potential <sighs> top line for Team USA moving forward back to the Olympics. I mean, that's not going to happen. But <laughs> no. Austin Matthews will take I was that say, spot. But... Austin Matthews, Jack Eichel. Like, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be more than a couple of guys getting Oh, Jack, Jack Eichel. Okay, let's, let's slow the roll there. I still like him, but not that much. I'm not saying anything other than the fact that at this point, <laughs> he's still Jack Eichel. He's still yeah. really good. Yeah, And and Johnny Hockey, 115-point mm-hmm. uh, player this year. All right, um, we got a couple housekeeping things we got to get to. Um, our boy Hunter Drew made his NHL debut. That was nice to see. We were waiting for so that awesome, to happen. Man. Hoping he gets a, a, a few more shots next year um, to, I, to be that kind of fourth line guy. Yeah, I would not be surprised uh, if he was up for the full year next year uh, because I think he provides an internal option for Pat Verbeek to not have to go out necessarily and, and bring in a guy like, again, nobody get mad at me. I'm just using him as an example. Yeah. Go out and bring back a DeLaurier, right? <laughs> to, to maybe just have that kind of physical there. If you have a guy like Hunter Drew who's on an ELC who you can bring up, he's going to be waiver exempt. He, he gives you far more flexibility, yep. and he still is going to provide um, that physicality. And we saw his goal scoring take a big step forward in San Diego. He has a good shot, um, and, and he's able to put it away. Now, how much of that is the kind of time and space that exists at the AHL level and not at the NHL level? You know, the joke was always, uh, George Paris's wife always made the joke. I knew George when he was a goal scorer. And then they would do the uh, Duck Skills competitions. And he won the accuracy challenge multiple years. The problem is, is he can't do it at full speed yep. with all of the game happening. You know, it's, it's a question of which one of those Hunter Drew is. But, you know, uh, you've also got a guy like Sam Colangelo who can maybe come up and, and, and be that kind of physical presence so maybe they don't feel Max Jones it. too right mm-hmm. yeah. to rush Drew but I mean you know Max Jones and Hunter Drew on a line together with like Isaac Lundstrom that's not a bad look yeah and can't you know. forget Mason, Mason McTavish is a big kid too I mean that's mm-hmm. not going to be his role but he know. that's the thing he's a very interesting one to me because he is going to be the I mean, it, it, right, like, they likely won't. So if they don't go out and get a Kachuk, Mason McTavish is the guy who fills that role. Yep. As far as a guy who's going to be physical, who's going to bother people, be in the who's crease. going to make sure you know he's there all the time. And Zegers doesn't shut up, so he's going to be there all the time. Yep. And, um, you know, but uh, the, as far as Hunter Drew, I don't know how the fuck we got all the way off. I'm sorry, but like Hunter Drew, I, I'm 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 happy for him, and I would expect him to play about 55, 60 games next year. Yep, still waiting for him to come on the podcast and explain his 129 oh. pims in 10 games in Slovakia. So that's so cool. <laughs> it's, it's, wasn't it like 111 minutes and yeah, it was some like 23 games. Yeah, it was it was ridiculous, something obnoxious. I know, I and that league is notorious for for high penalty minute production but that was that's, that's insane. Still, i still gotta know how that happened yeah. um olin zellweger made pro debut one game for the goals uh, i didn't end up watching the game but i i heard good reviews about how he played you know, he his uh skating ability was on full display got a secondary assist i think on uh, one of the, the the goals last goal of the game so nice to see him get a shot like i, I was a bit surprised to see that honestly i i, I know nobody expected uh, everett to get <laughs> get swept or I didn't get swept I think they lost in six games to one of the worst teams in the playoffs Everett I think was the best team uh, in the Western Hockey League and they they lost to a team that had a below 500 record in the playoffs which is so I don't think anybody expected them to go out where they did and Zellweger to be available 
to go and and have play any games uh, with the mm-hmm. AHL. But it was nice to see him get one. Like it's not it's not gonna make a huge difference on his projections for next year, but he got a little taste of pro hockey and didn't seem out of place in a meaningful playoff game against a rival, a heavy team in Ontario, and and he looked good. So it it was nice to see an early look at that you know he can do it or he should be able to do it and uh and what we've seen from him at junior is that despite his you know him being undersized as a defenseman his skating can get him out of trouble a lot we saw that uh in in a brief sample size with that game so you know I, i've I, we've talked about being excited about a lot of guys McTav- mctavish jones he's a guy when it comes to training camp next year i think all, a lot of eyes are going to be on him on, on what he can do and, and can he make the roster and and if he gets a few games with the ducks how does he adjust right you know the, there's always that question about guys who are labeled as undersized especially defensemen we we heard it a bit with drysdale right and how are they going to adjust how are they going to look and i think Dry, drysdale proved a lot of people wrong in terms of how quickly he adjusted to the nhl despite his size and i think zellweger uh is only going to do the same he, you know profile is fairly similar to to drysdale in a lot of ways so i I'm uh, he's a guy I'm looking forward to seeing, and I'm, I'm super excited that he at least got a, a game in that we got to see him at uh, at a higher level. Yeah, and I think it's exactly the kind of thing you want, right? Like you said, he gets a taste of that pro level, but more than anything, he kind of you hope he gets the bug, you know, and he goes into this summer and pushes himself and develops and gives you a reason to think about keeping him up next year. I still think you're right. I still think ultimately he ends up in juniors. But if he pushed for nine games and looked the way McTavish looked in his nine games this year, I don't know that I would be completely surprised. Um, you know, I, I still have questions as far as, like, is he going to be Yandel, Goss, Despair, bad in his own end? Or is he going to be able to use, again, his skill and and his brain to, uh, you know, mitigate some of that those issues? But even still... You know, he, he had to put up a lot of points for a lot of years. Shane Gossespear is not a bad player. He got, he got, it was weird for him in Philadelphia, but he can still put up points. He can, he can run a power play. You know what I mean? I mean, these guys are, 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 are impactful players when used correctly and when given the best opportunity to succeed. Um, so, you know, I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to this summer. I think once the uh, draft hits, it's going to be full speed ahead, and we're going to really have an idea of what the hell's going on around here because there's not a lot of room for ambiguity, in my opinion. I think one way or the other, it's going to be clear what the expectation of this team is next year. Um, as far as the level of competitiveness on a nightly basis, I don't think anybody expects them to push for the playoffs next year, but I think it would be reasonable to me for management to look at the way this year said, said okay, 10 was good, go for 12. Yeah. Right. You know, instead of dropping to eight, push up to 12. Let's see if we can keep to take keep taking these steps forward. Um, and no, no know. spots are guaranteed. I think that's going to be like you got to go in there every night and fight for your place in the lineup. Um, and I think that extends to everybody. Right. Like Zegers and Terry are the safest of anybody. But you got to go in there and understand like your spot isn't guaranteed. There are other guys that are going to be pushing to get into this lineup there's a lot of young players on the way and if you're not going to play well then there's a guy who's going to take your spot and I think that that's something we've heard from from Dallas Aikens in the past and and using that as motivation for a lot of players and we've seen them um you know, maybe not so much this year but in the past you know guys like Comtois and, and Steele have been sent down when they haven't been playing well and I think that's something we could we could see again this year with a lot of kind of players pushing uh and, and are on the cusp of being able to play for the Ducks um you know more than a handful of games guys like Perot and Tracy and Hunter Drew Ben Wiley grew who we've even talked about who played a handful of games for the Ducks this mm-hmm. year like there's a lot of guys who are pushing to get into the lineup ah, so you've, you've so you got to earn your place and you got to go out there and compete every night and and that's something we know Dallas Aikens is going to be looking for but one guy we know is going to be around at least and has a new contract is Sam Carrick I ah. love the deal I, I think it's great. I, thought, I was blown away it came in under a million a year. Yeah, I thought he was going to get a one and a I half. I assumed it was going to be one. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I thought he was going to get a two or three by one and a half. Yeah, yep. but uh, he gets a two-year $850,000 extension. Fuck. 
uh, great for him one to be able to you know get another two years new two year contract. I think it's a one a one way deal, which again, yeah, it doesn't really mean too much, but it just means he gets paid no matter what, which is great for him. It's great to see he's worked really hard to get to that point. He was great this year. He's one of my favorite players to watch. Just competed on a nightly basis and gave a hundred percent every time he was out there and he and he, he he did things well like he was one probably the ducks best defensive forward when you go and look at the underlying numbers he chipped in with uh what was it? i think it's, how many goals did he have this year sam carrick 11 had 11 goals two primary assists six secondary assists uh 46 percent expected goals at five on five 46.7 could coursey uh he finished with 1.5 GAR and he had an underlying XGAR of three nine. So yeah, he had a good year. Yeah, a good um, year, and he, he's a really good fourth line NHL forward. He's proven that. He's worked hard. You know, done it at the AHL level. Became a captain, one of the top contributors for the goals. Just really, you know, the worked his way through up up through the system and become a valuable player for the Ducks. I'm excited to see him back for the next couple of years. I'm excited to see him on the fourth line with a few different guys and see how that works for him. But um, he he's really going to be become what Derek Grant was a few years ago and a guy that if you need to move him up in the lineup, you can. You know he's going to play well. You know he's going to contribute. You know he's going to compete. He's got enough skill um, and, and a, a decent enough shot to be a good player that can kind of move up into the top nine if, if he needs to. Um, and for 850000 it's a no-brainer. Uh, you know, it's basically league minimum, 100k above league minimum. Like that, to get this guy for that, uh, I, I think that's a huge win for the Ducks. Yeah, no, 100. percent I, I, I really do. And you know, on to, to uh, on Carrick's side of it, I think it being a two year deal, he'll end up being I don't know, 32, uh, 32, 33, uh, depending on when his birthday is. But it gives him another shot at another contract, right? You know yeah. what I mean? He can have that two year deal. He can play well, and he can prove. You know, again. He's a full-time bottom six player, and he doesn't necessarily have the NHL minutes on his body uh, that some of the other players will. So maybe you know his 32 is a little bit closer to 28 or 29, and he can sign a two or three-year deal worth a million and change, two million something like that, and and really do some good for himself. So it, it I think it's a very easy deal to rationalize from both sides. I think it's a very clearly a huge win for Anaheim uh, as far as what he's going to bring to the team, uh, his ability to be a voice, to be physical on the ice, to play, you know, some matchup minutes, to to just be a trusty, a trustworthy player at the NHL level for the Ducks moving forward uh, in a way in which they're going to need because a lot of this is going to be up and down. Yep. No, 100%. Um, I think he's of the guys that um, you would want to bring back from the fourth line, I think he's he's the big one that uh, you wanted to come back. So last uh, piece of news we have here before we get uh, any closer to the two-hour mark is the Ducks, um, well, they first they axed Dave Donis, which is, I don't want to say it was great, but... No, it was, it was we, great. It was, it was great. Uh, Dave You're Donis. Dave Donis gone. Ducks then brought in Rob, I think it's Rob DeMeo, as the assistant general manager, also is going to serve as the general manager of the San Diego Goals. Uh, so that's going to be kind of his main role. And then um, just one of three uh, assistant general managers, along with Martin Madden. And, uh, God, who am I mixing up? The, the... Mike Stuthers? Yes, right? Mike Stuthers, right? I mix up him and, and the, the coach. Yeah. Came over. But, yes, Mike Stuthers, I believe. Um or the other AGM. So nothing's going to change there. Nothing's going to change with their um, their structure. You, you're questioning it too, aren't you? I can see it in your face. I, yeah, I am now. <laughs> I don't know why I can't I'm remember the name. God, it shows you how to, the... Uh... Mike Stuthers. Uh, he's an assistant coach for the Anaheim Ducks. Shit. So what? who why, is it? Why can't I remember it? Oh, come on. This is embarrassing. Ducks, a... I'm going to be really annoyed nope, when, just died. When, I, when I hear uh, when I hear the name. Paul McCartney. Because I know it, but I don't know it. <laughs> so, hold on. Michael McDonald. 
Unreal. Unreal. The Ducks uh <laughs> the the Ducks front office page just hit me with it's the It's fucking Jeff Solomon, isn't it? Yes, there you thank you. God damn it. The Ducks uh <laughs> <laughs> front office front office page hit me with the shit, don't even they hit me with the can't see oof. <laughs> can't see anything yeah they they hit me with the oof air 404 oof. error page not found oof. wow yeah yeah <laughs> la guy that's what i got they're both la guys I jeff remember. solomon that's his name god yeah so jeff solomon martin madden and rob demire are the agms nothing changes with the structure because basically demire comes in and replaces dave Nonis. His main goal is going, to, or his main job is going to be serving as the Gulls GM, um, and then he, he brings a, a long history of uh, scouting experience. We know the Ducks are pretty good in their amateur scouting department, but they've been trying to beef up the pro scouting side of things. We've heard that from, um, you know, the executives in the past and from Pat Verbeek as well to, that they want to bring, you know, kind of beef up that side of things. So Demayo's been an NHL executive for 14 seasons. Uh, he followed 19 years in the league as a player. He's been with the Blues for the last 13 years, uh, most recently as a director of player personnel, uh, and he's done, had multiple scouting roles with that team. It was a part of the team uh, in 2019 when they won the Stanley Cup. So, uh, again, bringing in a guy who has uh, got a proven track record, a proven winner, has been a part of a championship team, trying to build up that championship caliber and, and know-how in the front office. So, I, I, again, it's not a major move, but I think it is great to have those guys that have been around that atmosphere and have been around and knows kind of what it takes to build a winning team. And I think, you know, a great structure to, to kind of get an insight on is the Blues and, and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how they built that championship team and what they, what they did to get to that point. We know Verbeek's been around. Uh, Steve Eiserman again has a ton of experience from him, so you're starting to kind of put the pieces together. Jeff Sol- Solomon brings you know his side of things and being a part of a uh, championship caliber team with the Kings, and we know what Martin Madden brings uh, for the Ducks on his scouting side of things. So all of a sudden we've got kind of a, a nice look to the front office where Dave Nonis was like the odd man out there oh, God, for a while. It was, it was a, so embarrassing that he was on the fucking panel. Yeah. Just so stupid. <laughs> His whole job was just basically leaking things to to Darren Dreger, so uh, got him out of there. But uh, good good hire, and you know, again, nothing nothing we can really talk about for for twenty minutes. But I I think it's a smart move to bring a guy like that in who's had some experience and has been around a championship team, um, and you know, adds to what is now a, a pretty good looking front office for the Ducks. And Scotty Niedemar getting bumped up uh, to a role, and you you know you. I forget what his role is now. Special advisor. Special, or yeah, special advisor for hockey operations or something like something that. Something like that. Uh, the the thing I wanted to say about DeMeo that I think is is interesting or, or, or encouraging, I should say. Not interesting because it's, you know, whatever. But I would say encouraging is it actually kind of perfectly threads the needle as far as bringing in a guy with professional experience. But he's not bringing in an older guy. Mm. He's bringing in a younger executive who is now going to step into a larger role in a new organization. And I I think that's the thing about it that is very exciting is you're seeing Pat Verbeek bring guys in behind him that can be there for a while. It's not like Brendan Shanahan bringing in Lou Lamarillo, right? Where it's like, this is a very clear short window move until these two guys are ready and then we'll pick one of them, Um, which hasn't gone great. Um, but, you know, uh, I like that it's guys that can be around for a little while, um, you know, and I think having a guy with a scouting background like that can help kind of insulate them from the event that Martin Madden, Martin Madden? Yeah, decides to move on, uh, you know, and starts to look for something somewhere else. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, I, th- I think it'll be good. Um uh, you know, again, it's not it's not going to play a major role, but when you bring a guy like that with uh, the amount of scouting experience he has, and you add it to again a general manager who has a ton of scouting experience, Martin Madden, who's been a scout for his entire career, it's not bad to have some more voices and there more guys who who have been around and understand uh, you know player evaluation and player development. So, it's, uh, and he's not Dave Nona, so that's a plus. God, <laughs> man, I just so can't say that enough. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's wrap it there because we're almost at two hours. Um, we warned you all it was gonna be a long show because we have been. Uh, you know, well, we, Eddie was almost dead for a little while. Yeah, I, I had what I thought was COVID. It wasn't COVID. I was just I was out for for a week and a half, two weeks. It was there. Fobid. Mm-hmm. You had Fobid. Yeah, new the new strain. 
you had that that bootleg Gucci of COVID. Uh, but I'm back, and I think I tweeted out like end of April that oh yeah, like I'm fine now. We're gonna be doing a show, and then two <laughs> weeks pass, and we didn't do anything. Uh, but yeah, today today felt like it was the right day to come back. Um, draft lottery, kind of the night of easy way to kind of transition back into things and cover a lot of the stuff that we've missed but obviously we've got a lot of plans moving forward we've got um draft previews to come some interviews with some of the people we've talked to in the past and others uh we're going to work on a few of those and 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 have those ready uh leading up until the draft probably maybe at least two of them i would imagine a few different ones that uh that we'll yeah we'll try to sneak in two or three episodes at least between now and the draft um mm-hmm. even if they're not necessarily specifically draft related yeah um, yeah well we've got yeah. a few like kind of fun shows and we still we still have our lineup projection um that, mm-hmm. we, that we've been working on for the last month that, <laughs> that yeah, we've, ridiculous. we've got to do so we've uh we've got that coming up obviously like i said draft previews eventually free agency uh looking at that previewing that uh, as well and then obviously if, if any news comes out any trades happen which are likely to do at the draft then uh then we'll also cover that. And depending on on the timing, because um, I know every year, or at least for the first round, we've done a live stream of the draft. I'm, I'm not sure if we'll do it again. I don't want to commit to it not knowing kind of what the timing is going to look like and, and everything it's for... two months away. We have time. Yeah, yeah for, for July. But um, the plan is to do it, um, and we'll let you guys know a little bit closer to the date if we, if we can. Um, usually we... We, we just kind of cut it off after uh, the Ducks have their pick. But this year, it kind of makes sense to do it because the Ducks go into it with the top 10 pick and then the later pick, so we can kind of stick around for the entire draft. So that, uh, that's the plan. But lots of content moving forward. Appreciate everybody who came out live, uh, as well as anybody kind of still listening after our month hiatus um, <laughs> after the fact. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, we appreciate you guys a lot mm. and uh, looking forward to, to being back and putting out some more shows. Yeah, it was a good, long season, and we had a lot of fun, and it went better than we thought, and, you know, hopefully next year's kind of a, more of the same, so there's a lot to be excited about. How excited we get to be in reality is uh, still yeah. to be decided. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll keep pushing for a return for, for Pat and Jay sometime soon. Back to the I think podcast. they're dead. I think they're both dead. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We're pushing. We're, we're trying. Uh, so hopefully all got, they all got stuck in their avatar bodies on Pandora. So they're, yeah, they're never coming back. They're happening. just giant 10 foot blue people now. It's weird. Yeah. Well, yeah, they were casted as extras in the movie and that's what, that's where they've been. So top secret, but now uh, we've, <laughs> we've, uh, we've broken the news. So now you guys know, but uh, whenever they get back from filming avatar, wherever they are, then uh, <laughs> they'll be back on the show. But uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody coming out and, uh, We'll we'll see you guys soon. Take care, everybody. Later, y'all.